I am convinced that we are suffering from a lack of theology in the, in the church. And even us individually, we often suffer from a lack of theology. And what I mean is this, is that theology is like the snowbank from which the river of application flows. And we all like the river and we like the fresh, cool water that comes in the river. But we forget that that comes from that snowbank, that big, giant deposit of healthy, life-giving snow that sits and slowly melts its way down the mountain. And theology can be like this. It's like, it's like we're storing up teachings about Christ and teachings about God. And then in our lives later, when things get hot, those teachings sort of melt down and change the way we view our lives and we view the things around us. And it really has a massive impact. I can tell you as a pastor who has a lot of opportunities to do private counseling with people, so often I'm in counseling with someone and I'm hearing them and what I hear is someone who, who doesn't have a biblical mindset in their life. They don't have a theological, biblical worldview for their marriage or their family or their kids or the suffering they're going through and they go through unnecessary pain, insecurity in their faith, in their walk with Christ and perhaps sometimes very odd behavior. Like they just act weird because the theology is not there to sort of ground them. And so I think um, tonight we're going to talk about letting theology change you in Romans 5. We're going to talk about letting, letting the theology of the book impact the way that we behave and we think. And really, this is, this is what every Bible study should be in reality. We should let the Word of God transform us. So, and that's what, that's what Paul's doing is he's taking the theology he's laid out in Romans 1, 2, 3, and 4, and he's now driving home application in Romans 5. It's not disconnected. One really depends on the other. Romans 5 will talk about um, trials. It'll talk about having peace in your heart, in your relationship with God, and your confidence. All this stuff, it derives from theology. So it starts with theology, and then it goes to application. But so often we want, we want the shortcut. I want application. Forget about theology. I remember one a friend of mine, she once said, Theology. I mean, who's Theo, and why do I have to learn about him? And I said, uh, Theo means God. <laughs> and, and it just shows the, the sort of like, can I just have the quick answer? Can you just give me the Cliff's Notes version of the Bible? And the answer is, you can have the Cliff Notes version of the Bible if you want, but you will have the Cliff Notes version of the spiritual experience as well. Because we need this stuff. Um, so Paul has spent a lot of time in Romans giving us universal sin, salvation by faith, through grace alone, not of works. Um, and now he's, he's going to say, basically in Romans 5, he's going to start going into, and how does this apply to my life? Now that I've got theology, how does it give me orthopraxy, or how I live out this stuff in my life? So Romans 5 verse 1, he says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Now again, some might think this is like, how is this related to the rest of it? it it's all built on top of the foundation of where it says, for the wrath of God is revealed and then how his righteousness has been, been demonstrated to us and we fall short and all this stuff. It's built on that. So now if I'm saved by faith, which he's already established, what implications does this have for my life? Well, it gives me in verse 1, peace with God. Real peace. I mean, how's your relationship with God? Theologically, I'm positionally in Christ. So therefore, I should let this hit my heart in knowing that I have peace with God. Peace, not a ceasefire. You see, peace and a ceasefire are two very different things. A ceasefire is, okay, I won't shoot you for now. That's the kind of relationship some people feel they have with God. Lord, I'm, I'm walking good. I'm, I'm doing what's right. And I feel like I've got the ceasefire going. But he hasn't offered us a ceasefire. He's given us peace, real peace. A works salvation theology only produces a ceasefire until I fail too much. And then I've got, then I'm back under God's wrath. And I'm no longer in salvation. I've, I've lost the, the grace of, 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 uh, of Christ. But a salvation by faith, that brings peace with God. So you see how he's bringing theology into our daily lives. This is something I did not understand as a younger Christian. I, I treated my relationship with God like it was a ceasefire. I realized that sin damaged my walk with the Lord, and it did. But I, but I then feared that I was under his judgment, that I was under wrath, that I was no longer saved somehow. 
And that was because I didn't have that snowbank of theology coming down into the hard times of my life. So peace with God. But what about when you sin? Well, 1 John chapter 2 puts it this way. I, I love I love this. People often read 1 John and then they look at that as, as being some sort of a sinless perfectionism type book. But I think that 1 John chapter 2 verses 1 and 2, it refutes that. Let me read it to you. My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, so, so he's laying it out. This is so you won't sin. But if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, not for ours only, but also for the whole world. That Jesus, he stands in the place. He's my advocate, my, my attorney, so to speak. He goes, in my place, even though I've sinned, I have Christ who's defending me now. His blood washes me. I am not only once I was saved, but I am currently constantly preserved by the blood of Jesus Christ. He stands in that place for me. This is... This is what it means to be just, justified by faith, is to have peace with God. You may be a Christian, and you're a genuine believer. You, you believe in Christ, you trust in Christ, and you blew it. You totally, utterly blew it. And you feel horrible, and that's fine. Maybe you should. But you should not feel as though God's grace has left you. Because you have peace with God through Jesus, not through your works. And I, I love this. I wish I had had this at a younger age. It would have saved me some consternation <laughs> and some difficult times of prayer or worship where I felt like I couldn't talk to God for a couple days. You know, that sort of weird thing that was going on because I was lacking the theology. Uh, turn, if you would, to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. And it's going to talk about um, this throne of grace, this, this mercy seat. Now, the background you have to understand for the book of Hebrews, in fact, the whole book of Hebrews, you have to have some grasp of Old Testament times and of, of the Levitical system and of the sacrifices and all this sort of thing. And then the book of Hebrews just opens up. It becomes really sensical and makes a lot of really amazing uh, sense. But keeping this in mind, that there was this mercy seat, this mercy seat that was, that was, that was on the, sort of the cap on top of the Ark of the Covenant, and it was inside the Holy of Holies through which the, priest, the high priest would enter one time a year. And he would sprinkle the blood of that one particular offering, the Day of Atonement. That th this, was, this was representing what access to God that was separated by layers of separation, the people were. And only through blood sacrifice could, could one enter. But Jesus, when he died, the veil was torn. That same veil was torn from top to bottom. Could you imagine being the priest that shows up the day after the crucifixion? And you walk in and you're like, ah! You're like, I'm going to die. Like, it's open. It's open. And it was exactly the point. It's open. The way is open, right? Well, Hebrews 4.16, in that context, it says this. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, mercy seat, the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. I do think the throne of grace here is talking about the mercy seat, but not just the mercy seat in the temple, but no, what it represented, God's mercy. God's very mercy. We can come boldly to his, when? When we need it. When we need mercy and grace in our time of need. Jesus gives us access to these things. That's what's in Romans 5 too. Through whom, through Jesus, also we have access by faith um, into this grace in which we stand. And that is, is exciting. You stand in grace. You don't visit it. You don't borrow it. You don't cling to it. You stand in grace. And grace is the only way you could stand <laughs> after all the sins that you've done. I know. I, I, I googled your name. So we stand inside God's grace. Now, now this is where I, I think for me something that's helped me understand this concept a lot is the, is the difference between position and condition. So this is, might seem like an artificial way of putting it, but I think it fits the biblical terminology. I think it fits scripture. Um, see, positionally before God, I'm forgiven, I'm eternally in Christ, I'm washed and clean, I'm sinless in that sense. But conditionally, my current condition may not match my position. It's kind of like you might have someone who's a president, but they're not acting presidential. This doesn't mean they're not president. It just means their condition isn't really maybe necessarily matching their position, but it doesn't change their position. In the same sense, a Christian who's in Christ, I'm positionally in Christ. That's my position. 
I'm forever in Christ. But conditionally, I may be going through some struggles. I might be having some hard times. I may be needing some serious throne of grace from the Lord, in which case I have that because in grace I stand. By Jesus, I have access to the grace in which I stand. I am constantly there. I love that. So, my goodness, when I came to grasp through, um, through re- like reading pl- things like Ephesians 1 through 3 and studying really thoughtfully reading through it, when I came to grasp my position in Christ, I was like relieved. It didn't give me any excuse to sin. I felt no desire to go out and, and do stupid, sinful things. Not at all. I just felt utterly relieved because I'd realized how wonderful and huge and all-encompassing God's grace is in my life. And it was just like, oh, and now I felt like the floodgates of prayer and worship were open at all times. And we should let our theology impact our mindset like this. This is, this is what we're talking about when we say theology. Man, you should be having peace in your heart right now because you truly have peace with God. And then it ends in verse 2 by saying um, that not only we're justified, we have peace, we have access into grace. We stand in that. And then it says, and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. We rejoice in hope. Because I'm secure in Christ, I can rejoice in hope of the glory of God. I think speaking of really our eternal state, which is glory, which is glory. We could talk about heaven, whether heaven's sort of, in a sense, I'm going up in a sense, you know, but then heaven, there's a new Jerusalem, new heavens and new earth, and heaven sort of meets earth and comes down and all this stuff happens. But either way, I'm in glory. So it's sort of eternally glory at that point. Here's how I understand Romans 5, 2 here when it says we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. I understand it to say if you really know the theology of your total loss and sin, your total redemption and salvation in Christ, then when you think about meeting God, you can rejoice instead of be scared. Instead of be the Christian who's like, oh man, you know, you hear someone say, oh man, I can't wait till Jesus comes back. And then you're in your heart. You don't want to say it out loud, but you're thinking, not yet, Lord, I'm not ready. You're not ready. What does that mean? <laughs> what is that about? You're not ready. Oh man, it is, it is better to be with the Lord. It is far better to depart and be with the Lord. Absolutely. So you should be rejoicing at the prospect of standing before God in his glory. Not fearful because you know it's Jesus that gives you access. Then in verse 3, Romans 5, 3, it says, And not only that, not only that, like that's not even the whole thing, there's more. But we also glory in tribulations. What? Well, let me read that again. We glory in tribulations. Knowing that tribulation produces perseverance and perseverance character and character hope. This starts the not only that's of Romans 5. So in Romans 5 verse 1, he talks about some of the benefits of justification. Then in verse 3, he's like, not only that. And then again in verse 11, he goes, not only that. And he just kind of keeps adding more of the results of our, of our theology impacting our hearts. But here he says, we glory in tribulations. And then the final thing is going to be hope. It's, it's perseverance, character, and then hope. In context, keep in mind from Romans 4, right? This is not just hope in general. The description of hope in the last chapter was Abraham who believed and hoped against hope that he could have a child, even not considering the deadness of Sarah's womb, all that sort of thing. Not that he never uh, had any sort of failings. Um, he certainly did, but he, he had faith. Now, what does it mean to glory in tribulations? I really think if we're going to be students of God's word, and we're going to take seriously the, the statements of the Bible about the, the, who Jesus is, you know, like his character or his, his divinity, these types of things. We also have to take seriously things like this, like glory in tribulations. Tribulation is just a fancy word for bad times. Like that's what tribulation means. It's a really generic term. It doesn't mean persecution necessarily, although persecution is a tribulation. But tribulation is also like your, your roof just fell in. I mean, it's, you know, or you, you just found out you've, you've got like toe mites or some sort of weird disease. I don't know if toe mites are real or not. But, you know, you've got something wrong with you. That's tribulations. But taking the extremity of these words, we're not just okay in tribulations. We're not just okay in spite of tribulations. We're glorying in tribulations. What? How do I do that? 
Lord, I want to let this theology hit my heart and mind, change the way I see my life. If you're not glorying in your tribulation, then there is an aspect of theology that is not touching that part of your heart or mind. This is an odd mindset, in a sense, to the world. But let me say first what it's not. We're not trying to say, I sure enjoy my suffering. I'm, I'm not glorying because of tribulations. Like, oh, I broke my leg. Yes, oh, if only the other broke too. Like, uh, that's not what I'm doing. That's just weird. That's not about faith. That's just, a, you're just weird. It's actually a lot better than that. It's a mindset I have that while I'm in tribulation, I know that this tribulation produces perseverance. Perseverance produces character and character produces hope. And on, on, the, on the scale, I weigh this tribulation as less bad than the, than the perseverance, character, and hope is good. I consider that the benefits coming out of it are better than the pains themselves. That's, that's I think, what's happening here. There's good fruit in suffering. There really is. And we know this, right? When you go to college, you pay the professors to make you suffer. That's, that's right. You pay them to make you suffer. And if they don't make you suffer enough, you're like upset. You complain. <laughs> you know, this is, hey, this is, I'm not here for an easy ride. Like, I want to learn this stuff. You know, you give me the, challenge me, make me suffer. But it's considered worth it because there's fruit from that suffering. So you go through it, you pay, you pay the costs or someone else pays it for you. And then you go through the classes and you, you accomplish the tasks. And you consider this worth the efforts, worth the pain. It's worth the pain. We do this all the time in life. People who exercise, I've met one, of, one or two of those people in my life, and, um, and they consider it worth the suffering that they might be overall in better health or they're just vain and they just want to look attractive. Um, one or the other. <laughs> um, so it's fruitful. It's fruitful. And this is a super consistent idea. In fact, I'll give it a title. The Theology of Pain or the theology of suffering. There are numerous passages in the scripture. It keeps coming up, especially in the New Testament, but even throughout the Old. There is a theology about suffering that Christians have got to absorb. Why? Because it is your, your comfort in your pains. This is the thing that helps you through the hard times. We've got to get it in our hearts, and we've got to think about suffering now and not wait until we're in the worst situation of our life to suddenly start thinking, can I really glory in tribulation? Like that is probably not the best time to start thinking about these things, but to think about it now. So let's look at the fruit. What are the things that Paul is, is writing to us under the inspiration of the Spirit saying, this makes your suffering something you can glory in. You can see glory in the middle of this because it's producing fruit. And what's the fruit? Well, it's a progression, perseverance, character, and hope. Let's talk about those. Perseverance would seem, I mean, that's enduring. Persevering is when you, when you, when you keep going and going and going. I, I think of just keep swimming, just keep swimming. That's kind of, <laughs> that's perseverance. You will not stop. I, I greatly appreciate perseverance. Um, in ministry, when I'm looking at raising people up, which I really love doing is raising people up, I look at perseverance as probably more important than any sort of skill level that they might have in ministry. You might be a great teacher, but if you're not a perseverant uh, is that even a word? Perseverant? Sounds like perspirant. If, but if you don't persevere, if you're not like a long-suffering person, then it doesn't matter what your skills are. They're never going to get used. Perseverance is like a primary initial requirement for use of the Lord. We don't tend to think of perseverance itself as fruit. But without trials, there's no perseverance. And according to Scripture, enduring itself, just enduring, just going through it, is itself worthwhile. Here's where we got to have theology impact our minds. You know, you're sitting there and you're in suffering, you're in pain. You're like, I just don't see why I have to go through this for so long. <laughs> the for so long part is the perseverance. I mean, that's what's producing the perseverance. This is why in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, it tells us that the temptations we experience are common. But God, and God is holding it back. He won't let be, you be tempted too much beyond what you're able. And he'll provide a way of escape that you may be able to endure it because there's a sense of enduring temptation saying no even though you feel like saying yes that produces fruit there's a fruit in the enduring that doesn't come really any other way now i appreciate perseverance in other people i really do 
I appreciate people who are patient with me. I appreciate people who, who will keep doing the right thing no matter how, how hard it gets. But when it comes my turn to persevere, all of a sudden it doesn't feel like a quality anymore. We've got to remind ourselves that this is a quality. A dad who goes to work, works a good job, works hard, comes home every single day, takes care of his family, spends time with his kids, does all this kind of stuff, who perseveres. That is such a golden, beautiful quality. And the rest of the world knows it, but so often the guy who does it doesn't realize how valuable it is. But we need to realize enduring or persevering is a massive, massive, important and essential character quality God wants his children to have. But so often we pray that take it away prayers. And I understand these prayers. I've prayed these too. Lord, take it away. Lord, I don't want to endure temptation. I want to not have temptation. Just take it away. I'm going through this trial. I'm going through this suffering. Lord, can it just end? I totally get it. I'm, I'm with you. But if God always took it away, we would never learn perseverance. We would never, ever learn perseverance. It's an important quality. Um, Hebrews 10, he writes to the Hebrews. Now, remember the, wh whoever specific group the author is writing to. This group of people, he's trying to teach them sort of deeper theology, but they're kind of shallow. We read about that in, like, I think it's chapter 7. And he then writes in chapter 10, he says, Therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that after you've done the will of God, you may receive the promise. There's a sense in which he can look at them and say, you guys, you need to kind of go through it. You just got to go through it. And you're going to learn and you're going to grow, but you got to go through it. There's some trials which God takes us around. And there's trials God takes us right through the middle of them. And he's like, don't worry. You won't be burned. And you're like, but it's your heart. You know? yep. just, trust, just trust him and go through it. So perseverance is going to produce character. Um, that's what Paul says. Uh, so perseverance produces character. And I, I thought I should share a few words on what character is because we don't talk about that very much nowadays. I think it'd be awesome if in our schools we literally just had classes on character. I think that would be really wonderful and it would probably do a lot to improve society. If we had classes on character and talked about that and maybe didn't learn some of the other stuff that you can't remember you learned anyways. Character. What is character? Um, good character is consistent moral goodness consistent moral goodness in a person's life. I, th I think that that's in their behavior, not just in their ideals. Everybody's got ideals. This is why when you're young, you, you, you think, I've got the, all the solutions. But the, the truth is, you don't even know half the problems yet. <laughs> that's why I think you got all the solutions. But, 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 uh, but character is, is a, a long term. That's why it comes after perseverance. You're, you don't really have good character until you have done something for a long time. There's a character that comes from perseverance. A dad is not a good dad when his kid is three months old. He's such a good dad. Wait till your kid's 18. And then maybe we'll say you're a good dad. A guy's not a great husband when he's on his honeymoon. He's such a great husband. He's so attentive. Wait until you've been married for 20 years and let's see if you're a good husband. Because character doesn't show itself until perseverance is played out. So it's perseverance leads to character. That's, it produces character. But there's also learning character because you didn't persevere. <laughs> so there's lessons in life that way, of course, too. But God, it seems to me, generally speaking, I know that the, the way the world is. And we see this in media, right? In movies and in TV shows, the heroes are getting younger and younger and younger. If you look at the older movies, it wasn't a big deal to have a 40, 50, 60 year old hero character. Nowadays, the hero is like 12, right? I mean, you got these little, these kid heroes, they're like 12. And I even see this, we went to a youth, uh, a youth um, camp, and I think it was like four of the youth pastors that were like, you know, the disciples were probably teenagers. They were probably teenagers. They were probably your age. They're probably 15 years old. Peter was probably 15. And I'm going, man, I've read a lot, and I don't have any reason to think he was 15. Like, I, I don't know how old he was, but. But it's almost like there's this drive to like make everybody younger and younger. And, and, and here's, the, here's my comment on that. Um, it's fine. You know, if you want to have a kid spy on your movie, that's fine. It's a fun movie. But let's not forget that when you're in your teens and you're in your early 20s, you're still totally in training mode. You're most, for most of us, we are not in change the world mode when we're in our teens and 20s. 
There's a rare exception. God might do a radical thing through an individual's life. But for those who think, I'm going to radically change the world, it, it often leaves them just frustrated because they're looking for shortcuts rather than perseverance leading to character. This is why, and I can support this in scripture, this is why in 1 Timothy, when Paul writes about elders, he says, not a novice. About who, he, who you can make an elder in the church, not a novice, not a newbie. Not someone who doesn't really know, not someone who hasn't been there. We need somebody who has years of experience and reliability under their belt before they're considered an elder in our church. That's what Paul writes. Then you think, well, but what about deacons? Well, in the same chapter, 1 Timothy 3, in verse 10, he says about deacons, but let these also first be tested, then let them serve as deacons. Let them get tested first. Give them opportunities to do things and see if their character is there, if there's perseverance, which leads to character. In Philippians 2.22, he writes this about, about, um, about Timothy, Paul writing about Timothy to the Philippians. He says, but you know his proven character. Timothy's one who had proven character. He had gone with Paul. There had been years of ministry with them. And he'd seen Timothy turn from temptation and embrace the truth of Christ. He'd seen him handle and endure and suffer and all this kind of stuff. He'd seen this go down and it was a big deal. This is something that I'll just say for anybody who, who might need to hear it is that church hoppers don't get this. People who go from church to church to church. Now it's possible the Lord leads you from a church to another church. But if you find that the Lord leads you from church to church to church to church to church, that's not the Lord. That's not the Lord. God, he, it, this is like divorce to divorce to divorce. This is not the Lord. I really don't believe that's God. Church hoppers don't get this because there isn't a perseverance. And so then they don't get grounded. So then they have, a, it's, it's interesting because instead of stories of how that God has used them, they have large volumes of criticisms about the church. And they could write a whole book about all the churches and all the things that they've done wrong. But they themselves aren't being used by the Lord in any way. And it's like, well, you know, that's fine. But you're in the bleachers. You're not in the game. <laughs> that's kind of lame because God made you to be in the game to be part of this. Quitters don't get this. Quitters just don't get it. People who can only serve for a month, for two months, for three months, and then they just get whatever happens and they just, they just I'm done, I quit, I'm out of here. They don't get this development of character that happens over time. Think about Moses. Moses, God, you know, could have used him right away to deliver the people of Israel to do all the plagues, all this kind of stuff. But instead, he spends how long out in the wilderness? 40 years. 40 years? That's before he became the Moses that they knew. 40 years he's out there and he's a shepherd. And what is he learning? Well, he's, he's probably learning a million things that he really needs to know to be leading the people through a desert later on. Where to find water. How to take care of a flock. You know, these types of things that applies... To, to the people as well. These things just come over time. So I think that for churches that are looking for sort of that like amazing speaker, 19-year-old guy who's going to suddenly lead them into deep spirituality, good luck with that. I mean, unless the guy has a major like serious Holy Spirit anointing of wisdom, it's not going to work out very well. There's something in the scripture about this that defies our common modern views that like younger is better. You know what? You know what older people are? Older people are young people with experience. That's a good thing. That's a good thing. <laughs> and they have immeasurable value in the, in, the, in the church, so much so that the highest leadership of the church are called elders. It's considered an honorable, respectable thing. And we should, uh, we should recapture this in the body of Christ. So perseverance leads to character. Um, before perseverance, you have ideals, but after perseverance, you have character. Young people have ideals. Young people with experience, they grow character over time. So First uh, John 2.19, it says this um, along these same lines. They went out from us, but they, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us. They did not persevere and it revealed something about their character. Same, same kind of thing. Man, I appreciate people in ministry who go the distance. I love Pastor Gary, our senior pastor who's been serving in ministry faithfully for 
300 years now, I think it is, if, I, if I've got my math correct. And, uh, and I greatly appreciate guys who've been around for years and years and years. And I've been in ministry long enough now. I've been involved in ministry f uh, for 20 years now. And in that time, I've seen people come and go and come and go. And I've learned that the come and goes don't really have much of an impact. Um, and they probably have a lot of lessons to learn. God's not done with them. They're going to, you know, they'll learn it the hard way. That's, that's all that tells me. You'll learn. You'll just learn the hard way. You know, God, Lord be with you. But, um, but the people who stick around and serve, they end up with that, that testimony. So I love that. So perseverance leads to character, and then character leads to hope. How does character produce hope? That, to me, was the more challenging of the two when I first read through this. How does character produce hope? Well, I think what it means in context of Romans is a heavenly mind. Hope being a mind that is sort of aware of the eternal view of life, that kind of hope. So many Christians um, are suffering from kind of a shallow view of the world. We're surrounded by, by, uh, by a lot of media, a lot of magazines and TVs and movies and shows and all this kind of stuff that, that sort of has a view as though as though the universe stops past the clouds kind of thing. You know, there's, there's no sort of eternity. There's no sort of eternal view of things. But a biblical view, godly character, perseverance in character, it causes you then, as time goes by, for you to keep setting your heart and your mind on heaven. And it's all ultimately about what you can take with you, which is not much of the things on this earth. I mean, we pretty much take people with us. And that's what it becomes all about, is serving the Lord and blessing people. You've heard the phrase, um, you're so heavenly minded, you're of no earthly good. I remember hearing that when I was young. And people thought, well, it's a cute phrase, so it must be true. <laughs> you're so heavenly minded, you're of no earthly good. Well, let me offer to you what I think Jesus' response might be to that. It's in Matthew 6, verses 19 through 21, where Jesus says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where are you storing up your treasures? Well, if you have perseverance in Christ, you grow character, you more and more have that hope perspective on life where what matters is what's eternal and not what's temporary. That's the change of hope that takes place. Philippians 3 Verses 17 through 21, it says this. Brethren, join in following my example and note those who walk, uh, who so walk as you have a, for us, excuse me, as you have us for a pattern. Then he derides some. He says, for many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are enemies of the cross of Christ. And listen to this description. Whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly and whose glory is in their shame. They're, they're excited about the wicked things they do and, and enjoy. Who set their mind on earthly things. The opposite of the Christian. The opposite of how we are to be. They set their mind on earthly things. They're so earthly minded that they're of no heavenly good. For our citizenship is in heaven. My primary thing is I'm a Christian. Before I'm American, before I'm anything else, I am a Christian. I'm a follower of Jesus. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able to even subdue all things to himself. Interesting. We don't know what our new bodies will be like, but we know it'll be like his glorious body. As he came down into, into our likeness as a man, resurrected in a glorified body and will be made into his. Um, that's pretty exciting. Then Colossians chapter 3 says this, verses 1 through 4. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. We need to be so heavenly minded that we are of some earthly good. That's what we have to be. I've never met a Christian who's too heavenly minded. It's not possible. It's not possible. 
Because if I'm concerned about the eternal things of heaven, then I'm going to have a lasting and powerful impact on the people around me. This is the type of hope that I think Romans is talking about. That perseverance leads to character, character to a, a heavenly mind, that kind of hope. My expectations about what's coming. And from the perspective of a heavenly mind, life looks completely different. You behave differently. You pray differently. You suffer differently. You help people differently. I'm not content to just offer you help pushing your car. I want you to know the grace of Christ. You know, I do everything differently. Everything in my life changes because of this hope. So this is the scripture's sort of theology of pain, I think. It's this idea that the suffering you're going through is not worthy to be compared. The sense in which I go, okay, I'm in pain, but there's glorious things coming from this. Like Proverbs 16 says, um, the silver-haired head is a crown of glory if it is found in the way of righteousness. Silver-haired head is a crown of glory. Is that gray hair, did you earn it? <laughs> That's the question. Did you earn it? Did it come in that way of righteousness or did it just come? <laughs> And if it did, then man, that's a glorious thing. And I've known pastors who've gone, I can't wait to go gray. I think I might just die at gray. But who've, who've gone gray and then tell me that it, they find it easier to minister to people. Um, that people just receive from them more, more quickly and more easily because of their gray hair. And I'm just like, give me some of that, Lord. <laughs> I'm working on it. I got like eight right here in my, my chin. I'm trying to get them to multiply. But uh, I heard if I pull it out, two grow in their place. I know that's totally true and scientifically real, so, um, so I'll pull them out. So we are, uh, we, are, we are down with this, right? We get this. Like theology of pain. Got it. No problem. Like I'm suffering, but I glory in it. Not because I'm excited about pain, but because I'm excited about the fruit that comes from the things I'm suffering. Until it all goes out the door when you're actually suffering. You know, and I can have this attitude towards my friend, but not towards my own pain. Oh, that's fine. I mean, I can imagine how your pain is being used for God's glory, but my pain, that's different all of a sudden. This is where we've got to just faith it. You've got to just trust the Lord in these areas. Um, and some might, some literally would hear me saying all this and think, Mike, you're just being kind of mean. You're sort of putting a burden on people. And I would say, you totally missed the point. This is not a burden. This is glory. This is comfort. This is God's blanket of comfort for those who are suffering. Is hope. Is that it's going to change me and God's going to use it for good. He's going to transform me more into the image of Christ through this suffering. And it is worth it because it's temporary pain for eternal benefits. Eternal character transformation. Temporary pain, eternal fruit. That's how you can glory in pain. And this all flows from our theology of salvation. I like that. That's that's a that's an iron ironclad. That's a rock we can stand on. Then in uh, verse five, we'll read a little further here. It says, "Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us." I like the description here of getting the Holy Spirit. The love of God poured out into our hearts. Wow, that's neat. Some people think that the hippies made up the touchy-feely parts of Christianity. No, that was already there. <laughs> they just noticed it, some of them. <laughs> yeah, the love of God poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. What an expression of love. To th think about the, the love, like it says in 1 John, right? Behold, what manner of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. Like, think about his love for us. But how is it that this Holy Spirit poured out on me becomes sort of the reason why hope doesn't disappoint? Like, what's the connection between hope not disappointing and the Holy Spirit? Well, in Scripture, in Ephesians, for instance, it talks about how the Holy Spirit is God's like seal or guarantee, like the down payment of our salvation. It's God saying, here's, here's how you know I'm coming back. You know, if I, if I say I want to buy something, I might drop a down payment down and then come back later and pay the rest. Well, that down payment is the insurance that I'm going to pay the rest of the thing. Well, the Holy Spirit's like the down payment of our salvation. God's saying, look, here you go. Proof that I'm taking you home. I will finish this thing I started in you. Ephesians 1 puts it this way, in verses 13 and 14. 
in whom also, in Christ, having believed, you were sealed, sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. That means it's a done deal. You're sealed. Who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. So the Holy Spirit, not only do I need the Spirit to, for spiritual gifts and for enablement, for relationship with God, all these truths to walk in the Spirit, but I also have the Holy Spirit as a promise for what God will do in the future in my life. That's exciting. So the Holy Spirit then becomes a, like a way of knowing that you're saved. How do I know I'm saved? Well, I have the Holy Spirit. I have the Holy Spirit. This is, this is the evidence for my own heart of my salvation. It's in Romans 8, talks about this later. We'll get there. But it says, The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we're children of God. And then it says, And if children, then heirs. So to draw it out. Let your theology impact your, your, your hope for the future. So that's why hope doesn't disappoint. It's like a certain expectation. It's not the way we usually use the word hope nowadays. Like, oh, I sure hope so. <laughs> Are you going to heaven? I hope so. And no, no, no. It's, it's a confident, confident, certain thing. I'm going to heaven. I, I, my hope is something I'm expecting because it's real. It's going to happen. And it will not disappoint me because God's given me his spirit. Of course, he's going to take me home. He's going to take me home. Um, so the question I have for us tonight is this, is does this theology, does the theology of, of salvation, does it take you from, from your head to your heart? Peace with God in a relationship with him that's secured not by your works, but by his grace and the blood of Christ. Or do you think, no, I can't pray. Lord, I can't draw near to you because I have to somehow get right with you first. No, you just have to yield your heart to Christ. That's it. You are right with him by his blood, not by your works. Does this theology impact your hope for the future, knowing that you will be transformed from this lowly body into a glorious one so that you might have what perseverance and character and more hope? I think what we're getting at in Romans 5 is this. There, there's, there's the flash in the pan Christianity. And sometimes I've heard, I don't want to deride anybody, but I've heard some preaching that is almost like, like flash in the pan Christianity. And, and a lot of us have a hard time getting on the board, getting on board with that. We're like, I don't really, like, I don't think that my faith in God should be based on how much I freak out. You know, how much like I can scream or get upset or, or excited or that sort of thing. Like, like Jesus is the rock. There's a, there's a solid thing I'm standing on in Christ. And that's what God's bringing us to. The marathon Christian. Not the sprinting Christian, the marathon Christian. The race is not a sprint. Perseverance, character, hope. Let's apply this to our lives. Is there perseverance going on in your heart and your life? Is there character developing right now over time? Godliness, is that a massive priority in your heart and life? And then, how's your hope? How's your hope doing? All right, well, I wanted to get further tonight, but I think we're running low on time. So let's pray, and then we can uh, have our little back and forth Q&A stuff. So. Um, Father, we thank you for the fact that theology, it informs our hearts. Let it do this. Let it change the way that we feel. We pray, God. We, all of us, will suffer. We will go through tribula tribulation, Lord. We want to learn how to rejoice in it. How to look at personal character transformation as something that is of eternal value because our minds are set on heaven. How to grow stronger through weakness instead of weaker through weakness. Lord, conform us to the image of Christ. Let your will be done in us. We know that we have need of endurance, and so that's what we want to pray for. So let our theology uh, inform our minds and inform our hearts on, on how to see things and, and even how to feel about things. God, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Do you guys ever find that you're like in that moment when you've got, you're going through suffering? <coughs> And then it occurs to you that you have a theology that should apply to this. And then you have to have that battle of faith. Yeah. I recommend reading Romans 5. Go back to the word and just read it again. Refresh your heart in it and, um, and be reminded of it. Because I remember reading um, C.S. Not C.S. Lewis. Uh, no, it was C.S. Lewis. Yeah. Okay. You guys heard of the Pilgrim's Progress. John Bunyan. Well, C.S. Lewis wrote a book called The Pilgrim's Regress. <laughs> and it was, 
and it was about his it was it was it was an allegorical kind of like the pilgrim's progress thing about his his philosophical journey to christ and it's really interesting the way it's written he like meets someone named like uh, descartes who's teaching that philosophy all this stuff and he gets trapped in the prison of, re of uh, uh, reason which which is all materialism and then he gets no, he's trapped in the prison of materialism and reason comes and lets him out. And it's, it's all really interesting stuff. It, but in the beginning, it, he tells a story of going to a funeral. And how he goes to the funeral and every one of the funerals wearing a mask. And how the person who's, who's dying, who's on his way to die for the, and he'll, it'll be his funeral because it's all allegory. He's, he's got this mask on, this mask is happy, but he's shaking so bad the mask is coming off sideways and moving around on his face. And he's like a young lad and he looks up and he sees this and he's describing as he, I think he's describing seeing the faith of people who were older than him, who didn't really have faith, at least in his perspective. And that came true when he saw how they handled death and suffering. And yet so much of the scripture is written to inform us on how to handle these things. It's like, I, I got to get it in my heart now and not wait for pain to figure out how to deal with pain. I don't just mean physical pain. I just mean life. Um, I'm blown away. I feel like I keep teaching the same study over and over again. Even as we just do verse by verse. Because it just keeps coming up. Tribulations, trials, sufferings, pains, hardships, and anguish, and all this. I feel like the prosperity preachers do a lot of harm. We need to prepare people for pain. Not act like it won't happen. And then, and then they have to put the mask on when it does. I'd rather have a Christian be like, how, how, how are you doing? Oh, man, things are so hard. I'm so glad I have hope in Christ. Rather than, eh, it's fine. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, yeah. Book of Job was written for a reason. Just to prove the prosperity preachers wrong. 